If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 15. We're going to be talking about how to be effective. We're ministering in the idea of invite, and this is the last Sunday of our invite of telling our story and what that story represents and how we can use our life and how we can use the biblical example to share our story and to be who God wants us to be. In talking about the story and talking about the future, we're talking about there's always times within the church or there's always times within our lives that things take place and life happens and problems occur. And that's no different than in Acts chapter 15 verses 36 through Acts chapter 16 about verse 6 where where Saul and Paul were, uh, not Saul, Silas and Paul were preaching and they were sharing. A lot of people were coming to know Christ. And it says in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. And sometime Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city which we previously preached the word of the Lord to and see how the new believers are doing. Paul's mindset was, let's just not proclaim the truth to a group. Let's preach the gospel. And the Bible says, and many were preaching. So Paul and Barnabas saw that where they were preaching, they had other people doing what they were doing. So they took what they were doing and said, let's go back and minister to see the people that are new. And Paul and Barnabas wanted to go in and minister, to disciple, to get into people's lives and to share. They set in motion a priority not only to evangelize, but to disciple those that are new believers. And in the church and in the mindset, what we have to do is we have to look at when we tell our story, when we share our faith, when we get into people's lives, we can't just expect them to change because we came into their life, because we shared a story. Paul and Barnabas knew that not only did they get into their lives, but they had to reconnect with them and continue to get into their lives and to teach and to preach and to communicate. It's one thing to evangelize, and that's praise Jesus, we're saved, we're going to heaven. But a lot of times we get saved and we know we're going to heaven, but we falter on this earth because we do not have that mentorship. We don't have somebody that can come alongside us and minister to us as Paul and Barnabas were trying to do. That's why the church is so important. That's why our story within the church is paramount. We cannot just come into the church and expect the church to evangelize the world and expect everybody to change because a church exists. What we have to do is we have to communicate the truth, tell our story, and then go back into people's lives. Love people. One of the greatest things about Paul, he had a a focus that was unbelievable about changing the world. But he always had a passion, and he always had a love for people that gave their life to him, to new believers. And he always wanted to go back. He started a church, but he always longed to go back to talk to those new believers, to see how they're doing, to make sure they were doctrinally strong and they were encouraged in the faith and all the persecution of all the other churches. They weren't falling away from the side. They wanted to go into people's lives. And how do we set a priority? And how we set a priority within our church, a new priority, is not only to evangelize, but also to disciple, to grow to learn, to get into people's lives. That's our priority. That's what I believe is the most important thing that we could possibly do, is to get into people's lives and to share their faith. Paul's biggest word, I believe, that would represent Paul was he had a drive. He had a vision. He knew what he wanted to do. He had the right passion. The right passion. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord also. When other people are teaching and preaching the word, what we must do is we have to allow God to utilize other people's gifts, other people's ministries, and teach them and to love them and to help them along the way. That word drive is very important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, it says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessary is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel." Preach is not the job of my, my job is to preach, but the job, the name of preach is to proclaim the gospel, to say it forth, 
to communicate the gospel. Woe unto me, woe unto the church, any believer that does not proclaim or tell your story. Woe. In other words, Paul said, what, what are you doing? It, how can you proclaim the message of Christ but not proclaim the message about Christ. How do you know that he died on the cross for your sins and you accept the gift of salvation he's given to you? And how do you know all that and you take it to your heart? But you say, it's not important for me to proclaim it to my family and to my friends. It does not make sense. He says, whoa, stop, think. It doesn't make sense. It is not just for you. It is a message that I have given to you to proclaim, to give out, to tell to other people. So Paul and Barnabas are sitting there and they spent many times in the church and then they finally came together and they said, okay, we've done our job here. It's time to go forth. It's time to go out. And Paul said, I will take Silas. And Barnabas says, I want to take John or John Mark. And Paul and John Mark had a little rift. You ever had two people who just had a little rift? They, they were just chapped at each other. Paul didn't think John Mark was willing and worthy of the gospel ministry. So Paul says, I'm not letting Mark go with me. And Barnabas being the son of encourager, he was the one that always lifted somebody up. He said, Paul, that's crazy. He, he, he may have had made a mistake. He may have failed. He may have left. He may not have done exactly what you wanted him to do. But I'm not going to throw him under the bus. Paul goes, he's not going with me. And Barnabas says, well, if he's not going with you, I'm not going with you. Ever been in one of those fights? Sounds like a good old church fight, doesn't it? And Paul said, you know what? I will take Silas and go. You take Mark and you go. And guess what they did? Supernaturally, they split. So instead of one missionary... They now had two missionary journeys, which allowed four people to get involved in the ministry. And God allowed Paul and Barnabas to take Silas and Mark and start a wonderful journey. Which tells me there are times when things take place that we do not understand. And when we do not understand what takes place, we have to allow on God, even though we feel strongly about something, we have to allow God to work out his plan within our life. He's saying, don't put me in the back someplace. Don't just leave me alone. Barnabas looked at John Mark that left, that got frustrated in the ministry, that got frustrated following after Paul, and he just left him alone. And Barnabas, which is many of you, looked at somebody that is struggling, that is hurting, and you come alongside somebody, and you love them, you encourage them, and now when you look back at their life, because you didn't throw them under the bus, because you said, oh, you have a sin, that you're not worthy. No, you said, I love you in spite of it, just like Barnabas did to John Mark. And now John Mark becomes very profitable into the gospel ministry. Because somebody, because of Barnabas, said, I have a priority. And that priority is I'm not willing to leave people where they are. I want to come alongside and help out and encourage and to love. And you do that by investing. You do that by caring. And in Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 he says, And whosoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Um, the Bible says, but spiritually we really cannot have too much passion. The opposite of spiritual passion is spiritual sleep. And he says this in Romans chapter 13 of verse 11. And that knowing that the time that is now is high. Time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we could ever believe. He's telling the church, wake up. Wake up. Don't allow your slumber. Don't allow your, your, your laziness. Or don't allow whatever you're used to, to put you in sleep mode that you cannot do what God truly wants us to do. And we have plenty of biblical examples. I listed three biblical examples for you. The first one is Jonah. Jonah is an example of a missionary that God said, I want you to do something. And because he didn't like what God asked him to do, he went down and he went a different direction. He was asleep in a boat. 
He was asleep. God gave him a mandate. And he said, this is what I want you to do. And Jonah said, listen, I'm not going to do it. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you say to me. I don't think, I, I don't even want to even think about doing what you called me to do. So God made a mandate. Jonah says, no. Jonah ran the opposite way. And guess what happens when we run from God? <laughs> That's what happens. Bam, we hit a brick wall. We may be asleep in our slumber. We may think we're doing what God wants us to do, and we run away from it. God says no. He sent a major storm and woke Jonah up. And we know the story. The whale swallowed him up. He was cast out onto the sea, and then he realized what God wanted him to do. And because he hit that brick wall, because he was awakened from his slumber, he went back and he did what God wanted to do. And God miraculously gave a revival because one man decided that what he was going to do was going to do what God wanted and quit running from what God didn't want him to do. Well, there's another story of people sleeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is a beautiful picture of when God just asks us to do something. Peter, James, and John he walks up to him and he says, guys, it's almost over. You have no idea what's going to take place. Will you just pray? Will you just be with me just for a short time? I need you. And when somebody comes up to you, and they're, they're destitute, and they're struggling, and they're almost out of bounds, and they have no hope, and they walk up to you and they say, guys, I just need you to do something. Will you, will you just pray with me? Just, just pray with me for a little while. So they go deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus says, you stay here, and I'm going to go a little deeper. And Jesus got a hold of God, and great drops of blood was dropping off of his face because of the anguish and the fear of what was going to take place because Jesus was God. Jesus knew the anguish. Jesus knew just in a few hours the sin of the entire world is going to be laid on his back. He knew the pain. He knew the spiritual pain, the physical pain. And he said, guys, I need you to pray. So Jesus goes a little deeper and gets a hold of God in praying, but Peter, James, and John, they know it's important. They didn't really know the importance. For about an hour, Jesus was praying. He comes walking back and he sees his three most important disciples that's walked with him for three and a half years asleep just asleep. The world climactic event was about ready to take place. Heaven and hell is in the balance. The savior of the world that came to redeem mankind was about ready to be betrayed. And his three most important disciples were asleep. It's not much different than the church today, is it? Heaven and hell is at the balance. Jesus is saying, proclaim, to preach. But the church is in a slumber. People are dying and going to hell, but we don't care. We think about what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. And he gave us a message to go into the entire world, but yet we are in our sleep. And then Jesus comes back to him, crying, I believe, knowing what is taking place. He implores to them, can't you, can't you just pray with me for an hour? Do you not realize what's at stake? Don't you know what I have to do? And then you know the story. The soldiers come in and they arrest him and they go through the trial and Jesus is betrayed. And Jesus is crucified. And the event that the whole world history was waiting for, that God, since the beginning of time when sin entered this world, Jesus became the Lamb, the perfect Lamb of God, the Lamb without a blemish, hanging on a cross, perfect in every way. And the world's sin not just the effect of sin, the pain of sin. 
You can look at the billions of people upon this planet. One man came to this world to die for their sins. And upon the cross that he was a perfect lamb of God, every sin was poured out. Not just smelt. Not just looked at. The pain, the suffering, the agony, the feeling. You take any addiction, you take any sin, you take any pain, God poured out every feeling of emotion, every illness, every sin, every addiction, and poured it on Jesus. And Jesus became sin for you and for me. We have the gift of life because of the Lamb of God. Peter, James, and John, they may have known Jesus. And they may have known that Jesus was the Son of God. But they were asleep realizing the impact that Jesus was going to do. He was going to be able to redeem mankind from their sin. Well, the third person that was asleep... Samson. Samson was asleep. He had the power of God. The strongest man that ever lived. The power of God. And he knew what his power was. He knew that he was a Nazarite and he knew what his vow was. And God gave to him special powers. He gave to him a power that nobody else could have. But he started playing with his power not respecting his power, and in lying in the lap of a woman, he gave up his power because he wanted prestige and he wanted love instead of God. And sometimes when we start playing with the very power that God has given to us, once we start looking at, it is my story, this is what God wants me to do, but I don't care about where I get it, I care about what I have. I care about just playing the game. What we have to do is we have to realize that we have something deeper in our life. We have to have that passion, and we can't be asleep in our slumber when God's power is right in front of us. And then we have to have the right priority. We have to have the right priority. And in verse 38, it says, Then Paul disagreed strongly, since John Mark has deserted them, and they not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated Barnabas, took John Mark with him, and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and they left. The believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then they traveled through Syria and Sicilia, strengthened the churches there. There has to be a priority. When something is going to take place, there has to be a priority. When they realize what they should do, the priority is Paul knew that he had to do something. He had to leave where he was. Barnabas had a priority. Paul's priority was to share the gospel. Barnabas' priority was to encourage a fallen brother. All of us have a goal. All of us have a purpose. Whether we are evangelists or we are caregivers. Whether we share the story or whether we live the story. Whatever our priority is, when God puts something in front of us, there may be something that we have to stand up and say, you know what, that is not what I want to do. I love it that Paul, you know, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. It's our church, it's our first church fight. Okay, they were sitting, they said, no, we're not going to do this. Barnabas, you know, a caregiving, a loving guy. He said, no, that's what we need to do. So Paul and Barnabas, they hit heads. And finally, the Bible says it was such a strong disagreement that they agreed, okay, well, you do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. What happens is God does his thing. So what happened was when Paul and Silas went on their missionary journey, Barnabas and Mark went one direction. Paul and Silas went another direction. And what happened is Paul and Silas ended up meeting Timothy. And when Paul and Silas met Timothy, it encountered a brand new opportunity to spread the gospel to a young, mentored young man 
So they had a priority to share their faith, to give into other people's lives. Paul had Timothy, and they mentored him. Barnabas had Mark. He mentored him. And when it comes back down to the end, at the end of Paul's life, he's in chains, he's in prisons, he's about ready to die, and here's what Paul said. He said, I want Timothy, and I need John Mark, because he's profitable for me. That's restoration. That's love. If it wasn't for Barnabas looking at young Mark and saying, you know what, Paul, you're wrong about him. You're wrong about him. Just like the disciples were wrong about you after you gave your expression to God and God blinded you on the road to Damascus, those young disciples accepted you, although they were fearful of you, they accepted you. And I can't believe that you would not be acceptable of a young man that made a mistake, but yet I am going to encourage him. And at the end of Paul's life, he looked at him and said, you're right. Mark, he's profitable. Thanks, Barnabas. Thanks for disagreeing with me enough that you can stand with him and to give to him the encouragement that he needs to have in order to be the man that God wanted him to be. I like what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, and it's on your bullets, and I think. If sinners will be damned, at least let them leap into hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Wow. That means we're going to tell our story. If hell is going to be filled, we have a story to tell. And that story that we have to tell is that the story that Jesus Christ loves them, that can redeem them. And just like Barnabas, just like if you have failed, if you feel like that you've given your life to Christ, but you have walked away or you did not live up to somebody's expectations, Barnabas is going to come around you, wrap your arms around you, say, I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk through life with you. I'm going to make you profitable for the end. We need Barnabases. We need Pauls. We need young Timothys. We need men and women that are not afraid to share the gospel story, that's not afraid to proclaim the truth. We have to have the priority of life. And then, not only do we have to have the passion, not only do we have to have the priority, but then we have to have the right presentation. In verse 4 of Acts chapter 16, it says, Then they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and the elders in the Jerusalem church. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. With their passion, with their vision, with their purpose, their church was grown stronger every day. What is that presentation? Here's where we are. The presentation of Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, and Mark. Their presentation is this. There's only one way to heaven. And that one way to heaven is Jesus. I can give to you all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of directions. But you know what? You can't be good enough to go to heaven. And you're too bad not to go to hell. The only thing that you have is you have a, have a climax. And that climax is Jesus and what we have to do is that we have to come to the point that we can't glory in anything other than the cross. And when we look at what Jesus has done for us, we can proclaim the message of Christ in every area. And when we proclaim that message, we have the right presentation, and that presentation is Jesus. And here's what Psalms chapter 126, verses 5 and 6 says. They that sow in tears will reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He that goeth forth, weeping, caring, not necessarily for a stranger, but looking at God's opportunities that he lays in front of you and says, I want God to use me. Maybe you are a Paul that's an evangelist. Maybe you're a Barnabas that's an encourager. Maybe you're a Mark that has failed and you need a Barnabas to come alongside you. Maybe you're a budding Timotheus 
that you're doing your thing and somebody comes alongside you and says, I need you. You are going to be a man or a woman of God that's going to do great and mighty things for us. We have illustrations of people in the Bible that when they proclaim the message of Christ, power of God came upon their life. We looked at Peter just a few days ago where, where he failed God. He miserably failed God. He denied God. But 50 days after he denied God, he proclaimed, and 3,000 people were added to the church and baptized. We all fail God. But we can all come back with that failure and have the proper presentation. And that proper presentation is this. I am nothing. I am zero without the forgiveness of Jesus. That's where I am. That's who I am. I can look good on Sundays. I can look good during the week. But when it comes down to the presentation, to who I am, what I am, the Bible says I can't do anything without Jesus. I can glory in nothing but the cross. So when we look at what God can do for us and what God has done with us, we look at our church. We look at what God has in store for us. We are very diversified. We have a lot of strengths. We have a lot of weaknesses. We have some things that God is doing in a mighty way, and we have some things that we need to wake up to our slumber and some do some things that God has called us to do. It makes no difference where we are in the game. What it makes a difference is are we focused on what God wants us to do. So when we set that down, and I shared with this a little bit last week, and I wanted to share with it in the conclusion of the sermon today. What is the vision? What is the direction? What is our passion? What is our presentation? What does God want us to do? The vision statement of our church, the vision of Glenville, is to continue to develop and maintain ministries of excellence so that when people experience Glenville, they see an innovative, creative, and well-balanced church. When you tell your story and they experience Glenville for the very first time, what do they see? What do they experience? Do they experience a group of people that have a passion and a love for God? Their worship, their proclaim, their message, the teaching, is it about you or is it about me or is it about God? So if that is our vision, we go to our purpose. And this is where I want to finish. The purpose of Glenville is to first lead people to Christ and then into the membership of his local church family, developing them into Christ-like maturity and equip them for their ministry in the church and in their life mission around the world. I challenge our church to pray. What will we be like five or six months from now? What can we be like? I'm, I'm excited that the guests are here today. I'm excited that you're here. I pr pray that you're on with the trip. Just get on board and see what we can do. So right now, I'm just gonna call our church to prayer. Have a passion. Have a motivation. Have that presentation of inviting others to enjoy what God is doing. Bringing our body under unity, under God, doing what he wants us to do. That's our goal. Let me pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us. And we thank you for the souls that have been saved and the lives that have been changed. We thank you for the programs that have been established. We thank you for the staff that you've brought to us. We thank you for the members that have sacrificed the vision that you've laid upon their hearts. I thank you for everything that you've done with our church. But Lord, as we can glory in nothing but the cross, what we want to do is we want to say, what do you want our church to be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now? How can we be the utopia church that you have in store for us? I pray that you will call our church to prayer. And you, right now, you will bring to us, as we search out for him, the right person to lead our church into the next phase, into the next vision, into the future of the church. 
Lord, we're excited. We're thankful for where we were. We're thankful for where we are. But we're excited of what you can do. So thank you. Thank you for giving to us Glenville, a church that has a passion for you. Leaders that don't want to be stagnated, that don't want to be asleep. They want to move on. And I thank you for the church that will follow the leadership team and praying for that right guy, the right team to lead us into the future. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.